Hello everyone, it's Sersha, and I hope you're ready for a nerdy time because I am just going to nerd out about this book. I love history and I love the Edwardian era. I love ships. I love um, technology, like old-timey technology. So let's jump into this book. It's Thunderstruck by Eric Larson. This was published in 2006 and you might recognize this name because he wrote The Devil in the White City. I've not read that yet, <clears throat> but now I'm very keen to read it because I enjoyed this a lot. Now this is nonfiction, but looking at the cover and reading the back, I when I picked it up I almost wasn't sure. Maybe this is historical fiction. Finally I, you get into it and he has an author's note and it says this is a work of nonfiction, so everything that appears between quotation marks comes from um, something written, like a letter or court documents. <clears throat> so let me read you the back, and we will figure out what this is all about. In Thunderstruck, Eric Larson tells the stories of two men, Holly Crippen, a very unlikely murderer, and Guglielmo... I just... hang on, I looked this up, or I didn't look it up, it's in the book, how to pronounce it. Guglielmo Marconi. It looks like Guglielmo. The obsessive creator of a seemingly supernatural means of communication whose lives intersect during one of the greatest criminal chases of all time. Set in Edwardian London and on the stormy coasts of Cornwall, Cape Cod, and Nova Scotia, Thunderstruck evokes the dynamism of those years when great shipping companies competed to build the biggest, fastest ocean liners. Scientific advances dazzled the public with visions of a world transformed and the rich outdid one another with ostentatious displays of wealth. Against this background, Marconi races against incredible odds and relentless skepticism to perfect his invention, the wireless, a prime catalyst for the emergence of the world we know today. Meanwhile, Crippen, the kindest of men, nearly commits the perfect murder. With his unparalleled narrative skills, Eric Larson guides us through a relentlessly suspenseful chase over the waters of the North Atlantic. Along the way, he tells of a sad and tragic love affair that was described on the front pages of newspapers around the world, a chief inspector who found himself strangely sympathetic to the killer and his lover, and a driven and compelling inventor who transformed the way we communicate. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, if you don't know by now, I'll read anything that is even tangentially related to Titanic. So, as you might know, the Titanic had a Marconi room at that point in 1912, that was becoming the norm um, that ships would be able to communicate with each other and would land through wireless. So if I see anything about Marconi, I'm like, oh, Titanic, I want, I want to read all about that. And this was a great history of how Marconi developed wireless, even though he was not really a scientist. And the other story, the murder story, it's, it's kind of chapter to chapter. You switch between the murder and the invention. And it doesn't seem like they have much to do with each other. For about 300 pages, they don't sort of intersect or have a lot of, you know, meaning one story to the other. Which some readers might be like, I feel like I'm reading two different books and just switching between the chapters and that's annoying to me. I don't mind that because it is all the same time period. It's, you know, contemporary contemporaneous, is that the word? It's all going on at once. Um, and he's really good at painting a picture of this time period. So I was fully invested. I was like, okay, we're reading about Marconi now? Great. Now we're reading about Crippen? Great. Um, I loved all of it. This book, it just has everything. It has the time period. I'm wearing my Edwardian like corset cover thing right now, um, which is inappropriate. It should not be seen, um, but we're going wild here today. Um, so you've got, like I said, technology, murder, love. I, you know what, I'm not ashamed to admit, I love steampunk aesthetics, and that is something that I love about the turn of the 20th century, where you have the Victorian era going into the Edwardian era where all of a sudden there's so much more technology and um, picturing these old-timey people with their clothing the, and the, just the way that they were trying to figure out what is this new invention. I mean, it was just like new invention after new invention. It was such a wild time. 
to exist. Um, yes, so <clears throat> I love it. So let us read some things from the book that stood out. By chronicling, this is from the note at the beginning of the book, by chronicling the converging stories of a killer and an inventor, I hope to present a fresh portrait of the period 1900 to 1910, when Edward VII ruled the British Empire with a slightly pudgy, cigar-stained hand, assuring his subjects that duty was important, but so too was fun. It doesn't matter what you do, he said, so long as you don't frighten the horses. I just, I just love the Edwardian era. Okay. Ah. Uh, I just, imagine being in that time period and how bananas it was. I feel like every day you would be like, I, I can't keep up with all the changes, with, with all the progress and, <clears throat> and being a scientist at that time, that must have been totally nuts. Okay, so there's this guy, Oliver Lodge, who sort of, we could argue, first demonstrated wireless technology. But he had this thing where he just got distracted all the time. He was very into mediums, and talking to spirits was a popular pastime of this era. Um, <clears throat> the unveiling during Lodge's life of so many hitherto unimagined physical phenomena, among them Heinrich Hertz's discovery of electromagnetic waves, suggested to him that the world of the mind must harbor secrets of its own. The fact that waves could travel through the ether seemed to confirm the existence of another plane of reality. If one could send electromagnetic waves through the ether, was it such an outrageous next step to suppose that the spiritual essence of human beings, an electromagnetic soul, might also exist within the ether, and thus explain the hauntings and spirit wrappings that had become such a fixture of common legend? Reports of ghosts inhabiting country houses, poltergeists rattling abbeys, spirits knocking on tables during seances, all these, in the eyes of Lodge and fellow members of the society, seemed as worthy of dispassionate analysis as the invisible travels of an electromagnetic wave." Um, so throughout the book, you see Lodge sort of <clears throat> get right on the, right on the tail of Marconi, like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be the first one to improve wireless and um, be able to communicate from really far distances. But then he just falls back into getting interested in something else. And I totally can sympathize with that because Marconi is this guy that is singular in his interest. He, from a very young age, is obsessed with wireless and getting these waves to cooperate. Um, and eventually being able to communicate across the Atlantic. That was his thing. And he was just, yeah, he was completely obsessive. Like, there's no better word for it. And... Lodge is more like a renaissance man who's like, I've got a lot of interests, and yeah, I'm pretty good at this one thing, and I could maybe further this scientific discovery, but what about, what about, um, palm reading and, like, crystal balls and stuff? I don't know if he was into that, but, you know, um, this whole thing with mediums. So I just thought, Oliver Lodge is distracted. That could be, like, a great sitcom. And every episode he is distracted by something else. <clears throat> it's really hard to talk when, like, I'm alone most of the time, and then my voice doesn't work, and I'm trying to talk to a camera, so sorry about that. Um, this is a great little bit here that shows kind of the opinion of science at the time. Talking about seances and all that, this turn toward the veil was largely Darwin's fault. By reducing the rise of man to a process that had more to do with accident than with God, his theories had caused a shock to the faith of late Victorian England. The yawning void of this new Darwinian darkness, as one writer put it, caused some to embrace science as their new religion, but turned many others into the arms of spiritualism, and set them seeking concrete proof of an afterlife in the shifting planchettes of Ouija boards. In the mid-1890s, Britain had 150 spiritualist societies. By 1908, there would be nearly 400. Queen Victoria herself was rumored to have consulted often with a medium who claimed to be in touch with her dear dead husband, Albert, the Prince Consort. 
oh, Victoria and Albert, man, they really loved each other. Um, it's sad when you read about how he died pretty young and she just spent the rest of her reign as queen in mourning. Um, but I love that phrase, Darwinian darkness. Like, we find out the truth about science and that evolution is a thing, and all of a sudden everybody's very freaked out because that shakes their faith. <sighs> what a time. So this is interesting. You know Kelvin, right? That's a science name that we've all heard. So Kelvin was almost going to join forces with Marconi in his company. But what troubled him was the idea that in allying himself with Marconi, he would be joining an enterprise devoted not just to exploring nature's secrets, but to making as much profit as possible. Um, <clears throat> Kelvin wrote, in accepting to be consulting engineer, I am making a condition that no more money be asked from the public. For the present, at all events, it seems to me that the present syndicate has as much capital as is needed for the working prospect. I am by no means confident that this condition will be acceptable to the promoters, but without it I cannot act. For Marconi, this was an untenable condition, and Kelvin never did become consulting engineer. So, there we have it. Marconi loved money. He just loved it. And he does a lot of stuff that's real questionable and um, not great. So, we will see some of that. This is super funny. Marconi sets up wireless so that Queen Victoria can talk to Edward when he is not super far away, but like on an island, and she's really, you know, she's a mom, wants to talk to him. And this is like the origin of boring texts. I think it's so great. Um, August 4th, 1898, Sir James to Victoria. His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales has passed another excellent night and is in very good spirits and health. The knee is most satisfactory. August 5th, 1898, Sir James to Victoria. His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales has passed <clears throat> another excellent night and the knee is in good condition. <laughs> there was this heated exchange from a woman aboard the Osborne to another at the house. Could you come to tea with us someday? A reply came rocketing back through the ether. Very sorry, cannot come to tea. I just, I love picturing these people already using this technology to have these, these little exchanges. <clears throat> so at one point, Marconi's in America trying to find the perfect place to set up his giant station, because he thinks it needs to be massive to be able to send these waves across the Atlantic Ocean. And, um... People are really wary about this technology and, and having this station there because it's a it's a loud thing at this time. That's thunderstruck. Um, it sounds like thunder cracking when they would send these signals. So nobody really wants this around. Um, but he finds this guy, Cook, and Cook has this land that he is willing to sell to Marconi. And it says... Whether either man recognized the paradox therein is unclear, but here was Marconi, whose technology promised to make the sea safer, acquiring land from a man who had made his living harvesting precisely the wrecks Marconi hoped to eliminate. In the future, these eight acres of seaside land would be some of the most coveted terrain in the world, but at this time the stretch was considered worthless. Marconi bought it for next to nothing. It's just, I thought, the world hasn't changed very much, has it? This guy... He was a wrecker, like, um, I don't think he was causing the shipwrecks, but he would go to shipwrecks and harvest all the crap that he could from them to make money. And Marconi is buying land from him to set up wireless so that ships can communicate with each other so that disasters don't happen. It is, yeah. <clears throat> Just bananas. Oh, I love this part about um, some people working at Marconi's station. A photograph from the time shows Carl and Mabel seated on the beach on a bright day with sun. On a day bright with sun. What makes this photograph unusual is that it captures people actually having fun. 
Mabel is wearing her apron and maid's cap and is turned away from the camera watching the sea. Carl is wearing a light-colored suit and looks into the camera, a huge grin running from one earlobe to the other. He also is wearing a maid's cap. It's just so cute. People, people having fun in that era is my obsession. I just I love to see photos of people back then enjoying themselves. Because um, <clears throat> we're so used to, to seeing pictures of them where they're very stoic. And that's for specific reasons. To do with photography and all that, but that's what makes it so exciting when we see them really smiling and just you just realize, oh, like humans have kind of always been the same, and that's precious. Um, <clears throat> this okay, I wrote, Why are old timey people so funny? On Christmas Day, two operators with Anglo-American cable exchanged salvos of doggerel. One in Nova Scotia tapped out. Best Christmas greetings from North Sydney. Hope you are sound in heart and kidney. Next year will find us quite unable to exchange over the cable. Marconi will fi will our Finnish see. The cable companies have ceased to be. They're, they're on the verge of being made obsolete by Marconi because these are the people who run, I, which I didn't even know about this, they run cables under the water, okay? These cables are across the Atlantic on the ocean floor, and that's how people spoke to each other um, over the Atlantic before wireless. Did you know that? So they're talking about becoming obsolete, but they're doing it in rhyme, and that is so bizarre and funny. <clears throat> and the other guy responds, don't be alarmed, the cable companies will not be dead, the cable co's will not be dead as you suppose. Marconi may have been deceived in what he firmly has believed, but be it so or be it not, the cable routes won't be forgot. His, his speed will never equal ours. Where we take minutes, he'll want hours. Um, so on and so forth. It's, it's too funny. Okay. <clears throat> there is this... Uh, Banquet for Marconi in 1902 Banquet of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, and he's the guest of honor um, And just just listen to this they held an elaborate banquet black signs at three points in the room bore the names Marconi Poldu and st. John's with strings of lamps hung between them at intervals the lamps flashed three dots the menus were printed with ink made from Italian olive oil, and the soup for the evening was potage electrolytique. Bowls of sorbet emerged, decorated with telegraph poles and wireless masts. The theming! The theming of it all, my god, it is so extra. Take me there, I would, I would pay to get in a time machine and go to that banquet and just be like, man, you guys are so, so extra. The, Italian olive oil, the menus printed with ink made from Italian olive oil because Marconi's Italian. <clears throat> All the little places set up like his like his Marconi stations and stringing things between them and the telegraph poles and oh my god, they knew how to have a party. That's for sure. I just feel like that that art has been lost a little bit and um, we need to return to such ridiculously extra theming of parties. Oh, so Marconi notices that um, the daylight interferes with the waves um, and he can't really send messages during the day and this makes him crazy. And he says, damn the sun, how long will it torment us? And I just marked that because it reminded me of the part in the office uh, when Gabe says, shut up about the sun! So I thought that would be just fun for fans of The Office. <clears throat> um, so, what in the world are we talking about here? We're, I haven't really talked about the murder much. It is very interesting. I don't know why I'm, I'm only tabbing things about Marconi. Um, but the, as the book progresses, he gives us some chapters that sort of place us in time. Uh, it says, as if the world really were 
As if the world really were coming to an end, Haley's comet appeared in the skies overhead, raising fears of a collision and prompting rumors of dire events yet to come. And I just said, um, nothing has changed. It's always doomsday. We still say this, like, anytime any sort of disaster happens, we're like, this is it. The end is coming. Or if too much progress happens, this is it. The end is coming. This is, this is the end days. Um, so people have always done that. Um, here we're introduced to Beatrice O'Brien, who is to become Marconi's first wife. Beatrice was 19 years old and one of 14 children of the 14th Baron Inchiquin Edward Donna O'Brien, who had died four years earlier, possibly from parental exhaustion. Because he has 14 kids. I was like, oh, I wish he would unleash that humor more in this book, because he says some things that are pretty funny, but for the most part, uh, he keeps it serious. But you can tell he he can write um, funny prose. And Beatrice, I just love her. Because, so, Marconi is... Ugh, he's always going for these really, really young women. And that's weird enough, but... <clears throat> he sees... He, first he has one engagement, and he basically blows her off because he's so obsessed with his work. And then he totally falls for this woman because she's the most beautiful woman ever. And what does he do to her? Pretty much blows her off for his work. And at this point he has two kids with her and he still, he just says, forget you, family. Um, yeah, it sucks. But I like Beatrice um, because he keeps trying to propose to her and she just is not having it. Um, she's writing to her sister. It's so serious. I don't know how to break it to you. She wrote I'm not crazy It's only this I've settled the most serious thing in my life. Can you guess it? I am engaged to be married to Marconi. I don't love him I've told him so over and over again He says he wants me anyhow and will make me love him. I do like him so much and enough to marry him She added and to think I never meant to marry. I had always arranged to be an old maid It's like same girl Oh, she's great. Let's see, Marconi does something else not cool. Oh yeah, so they're on a ship, Beatrice and Marconi. One day Beatrice entered their stateroom to find Marconi consigning his dirty socks to the sea through a porthole. Stunned, she asked him why. His explanation, it was more efficient to get new ones than wait for them to be laundered. Ugh, like that's a great description of character. Come on, Marconi. Do better. <clears throat> okay, so finally something about the murder. So this guy, Dr. Crippen, he's married uh, to a really overbearing woman by all accounts, and she is constantly threatening to leave him and tells him specific men that will take her and so eventually he falls into this affair with this typist and they can't be together at this point in England. The law is you can't um, get a divorce unless like abandonment happens and then you can't get remarried unless that person that you were married to is dead. So this whole convoluted thing happens where he pretends that uh, his wife has gone to America when in actuality her remains are buried in the cellar. And once investigators start poking around, he takes his typist, Ethel, his new lady, and dresses her like a boy, pretends he's her father, and they go on the run. And when they get to Brussels, it says Crippen identified himself in the hotel's register as John Robinson, age 55, and listed his occupation as merchant. At entry number five, de naissance, or place of birth, he wrote Quebec, and beside de domicile wrote Vienna. He identified Ethel as John Robinson Jr. and explained to the innkeeper's wife, Louisa Talese, that the boy was ill and that his mother had died two months earlier. They were traveling for pleasure, he said, and planned to visit Antwerp, The Hague, and Amsterdam. And I just said, dude, that is too convoluted for a lie. When you're lying, especially like you're on the run from the law, you gotta keep your lie as close to the truth as possible. He just threw in so many details like he was a new creative writing student and was like, I'm doing character building and background, and this is 
these are all the little things about my life. Isn't that fun? Bro, just keep it simple. But anyway, he was a murderer, so. Okay, back to Marconi doing questionable stuff. He gets pretty sick at one point. He has malaria, and it's flaring up, and Beatrice has already just lived through the loss of their new baby and is still grieving. So, Marconi is just, he's nuts. He, he clipped funeral advertisements from newspapers and displayed them on a bedside table. Beatrice, grieving her lost daughter and anxious about her husband's health, did not think this was funny. At one point, she stepped out for a walk and to bring a new prescription to a nearby chemist's shop. She returned to find Marconi standing on his head in the bedroom. She was convinced he had gone mad. Once he was upright again, he explained that he had bitten his thermometer and broken it and swallowed some of the mercury. Standing on his head had seemed the most efficient means of getting the mercury out of his body. Why? Why do women always have to put up with this nonsense? Okay. Um, so here's Marconi talking about how he's not a scientist. He gets the Nobel Prize. Okay? Nobel Prize for physics, for wireless. Um, to Marconi, the prize was an immense honor and utterly unexpected, for he had never considered himself a physicist. In the opening moments of his Nobel lecture in Stockholm, Marconi conceded that he was not even a scientist. I might mention, he said, that I never studied physics or electrotechnics in the regular manner, although as a boy I was deeply interested in those subjects. And he frankly admitted that he still did not fully understand why he was able to transmit across the Atlantic, only that he could. As he put it, many facts connected with the transmission of electric waves over great distances still await a satisfactory explanation. So the idea that th this guy was able to do this without really understanding how he was doing it, it's just, it's so cool and just mind-blowing. Okay. All right, so while Dr. Crippen is on the run, um, the police are starting to just arrest everybody that looks like him. One man who resembled Crippen found himself arrested twice and released twice. On the first occasion, he took the experience in good part. But when the same thing happened a second time, he was highly indignant and said it was getting a habit. <laughs> Which is just hilarious. Just, just picture somebody in the Edwardian era just kind of laughing it off. Oh, oh you, you arrested me once. This is kind of funny. And then they do it again, and he's like, I, I'm pretty indignant now. Like, you're getting into the habit of arresting me, and I don't like it. Um, but probably very polite about it. Oh, dear. Okay, there's this great part about the cage of glass. So while um, Ethel, the typist, and Dr. Crippen are on a boat sailing to America, really trying to you know, get away, even though Ethel doesn't know that he's murdered his wife, so supposedly she's innocent. Um, while they're on this boat, the whole world knows that they're on the run. Because the captain of the ship recognized them, and he sent a wireless telegraph back to London and said, I think this is them on the ship. And so the, ins the lead inspector or detective hopped on a faster ship to try and beat them to Quebec so that he could board their ship and be like, you're arrested. Um, <clears throat> so it is this crazy, like, situation that just hadn't happened before and couldn't really be repeated because at this point in time, this technology was new enough that this, this, is, this was unheard of. Two people could be criminally on the run on a ship and the whole world knows it and is watching and waiting for the detective to catch up to the ship, but those two people have no idea. They have no idea the world knows, because there's no newspapers being delivered here. There's no internet where they can read some articles about themselves. They're just blissfully on a ship pretending to be father and son and thinking the, the captain's very, very nice to them, when really the captain is, like, keeping them happy because he knows who they are. So anyway, um, for editors around the world, one point seemed obvious. Wireless had made the sea less safe for criminals on the run. The French newspaper Liberté pro proclaimed that wireless has demonstrated that from one side of the Atlantic to the other, a criminal lives in a cage of glass where he is much more exposed to the eyes of the public than if he remained on land. 
So yeah, you can't you can't hide anymore. It's the modern era. And this I love Kendall, the captain of the Montrose, where um, Ethel and and Doctor Griffin are. He's been communicating with this detective, and the detective says, "Please keep any information till I arrive there strictly confidential." Kendall replied by wireless, "What the devil do you think I have been doing?" Like, of course I've been keeping it confidential. Kendall's so cool. Where are we? Almost done. Oh, okay, so you know how I, I said I'll read anything related to Titanic? I'll read anything with even a sentence about Titanic. So here, finally, we get our Titanic mention. You know, in the end of the book, this is, I think, yeah, this is already in the epilogue. Um, so it says, The Crippen Saga did more to accelerate the acceptance of wireless as a practical tool than anything the Marconi company previously had attempted. Which makes sense. You know, this was a very flashy thing that happened. And people who thought, why would we need wireless, are now like, oh, that's kind of useful. Uh, this effect of the Crippen case tended to be overlooked, however, because of an event a year and a half later that further sealed Marconi's success. In April 1912, the Titanic struck an iceberg and sank, but not before the ship's wireless operator, a Marconi employee, managed to summon help. And this, get this, Marconi and Beatrice were supposed to be passengers on the Titanic as guests of the White Star Line. Marconi cancelled, however, and sailed a few days earlier on the Lusitania, Compulsive as always, he wanted to take advantage of the Lusitania's public stenographer, who he knew to be very efficient. Beatrice retained her booking. On the eve of the voyage, however, she too cancelled. Their son had fallen ill with a high fever. The family was living then in a rented house called Eaglehurst, whose grounds had an 18th century tower that overlooked Southampton Water. Beatrice and her daughter Degna, then three and a half, climbed to the top and watched the great ship as it left on its maiden voyage. They waved, and dozens of handkerchiefs and scarves were waved back at us, Degna wrote. The departure saddened Beatrice. She had wanted very much to be aboard. In remarks before the House of Commons, Lord Herbert Samuel, England's postmaster general, said, Those who have been saved have been saved through one man, Mr. Marconi, and his wonderful invention. On March 8, 1913, a ship equipped with wireless set out to hunt and report the presence of icebergs, and sparked the formal inauguration in 1914 of the International Ice Patrol. Since then, no ship within protected waters has been lost to a collision with an iceberg. Fascinating stuff. Um, and it is the beginning of Titanic week. Um, tomorrow's the 10th, April 10th, was when Titanic set out from Southampton. So, thus starts the week of talking about, thinking about, remembering, honoring, um, the Titanic, and all that. So, what was I going to say? Oh yes, yeah, so on my trip recently that I talked about in the last video, I ended up going to Southampton, which wasn't part of the plan, but I ended up in Southampton for a day, and it was so cool seeing how you, you can walk all around the city and it's just like Titanic, 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 there's so many things related to Titanic because that's where it took off from and most of its crew was from there. So um, Southampton suffered a huge amount of loss because most of that crew died on the ship. Um, so that huge part of the population was just wiped out and there were streets of widows. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, there's, there's a museum, there's a lot of memorials. You can sort of see the dock where the Titanic took off from. Uh, so many things. I stayed in the White Star Tavern where uh, this is a historic building and I got to look at the window where people bought tickets for Titanic. Just incredible. Um, I may throw in some things in my next video because I think we're going to do a Titanic book. And um, I could put some clips in there, some photos perhaps. So anyway, oh, I got excited about Titanic. It happens.
Okay, this part was funny. Uh, Marconi's inventions and advances by engineers elsewhere in the world led quickly to the wireless transmission of voice and music. In 1920, the Marconi company invited Dame Nellie Melba to its station at Chelmsford to sing over the airwaves. At the station, an engineer explained that her voice would be transmitted from the station's tower. Misunderstanding, Dame Melba said, Young man, if you think I'm going to climb up there, you are greatly mistaken. Just so adorable. Um... I love these people and their, their naivete about technology. She thought she was going to have to climb the radio tower. Ah, wonderful. <clears throat> okay, and so finally we come to Marconi's passing in 1937. Um, it says at 6 o'clock that evening when his funeral began, wireless operators around the globe halted telegraphy for two minutes. For possibly the last time in human history, the great hush again prevailed. What a solemn moment and a um, nice way to show respect to the creator of wireless, and even if there are disagreements about who really discovered it. Um, but yeah, that great hush is talked about earlier in the book. Um, how the world was just, it was a lot more silent, and then with the invention of wireless, suddenly everybody's tapping out messages to each other about coming to tea. Um, and sometimes wouldn't it be nice to just have a great hush again? Uh, this just made me cry. So coming back to Lodge, who was really into seances and things and all sorts of distractions from wireless, he published a book called Raymond, which is his son's name. He lost his youngest son to World War I, and he believed that during sittings with mediums, he had conversed with his son. So he published this book in 1916, in which he offered comforting advice to the bereaved. I recommend people in general to learn and realize that their loved ones are still active and useful and interested and happy, more alive than ever in one sense, and to make up their minds to live a useful life till they rejoin them. Oh, I'm really really got me because um, what do you do when you're grieving? You just sometimes feel like you don't want to do anything but get through this this life so that you can get to the next one and, and be with whoever you're missing. Um, so it's really nice that he says, live a useful life now till you rejoin them. Yeah. <sighs> okay. So eventually, uh, Ethel, she's changed her last name, and um, she ends up, well, she's in New York for, or no, she's in New York, she ends up in Toronto for a while, um, doesn't love Canada, goes back to London. Uh, she meets a man named Stanley Smith. They married and raised two children in the peaceful middle-class community of East Croydon. In time, she and Stanley became grandparents, but soon afterward he died. He never learned... Her true past. So Ethel, who was, she literally was on trial for being an accessory to a murder. She was found innocent. But one of the most famous murders of this time. And her husband never found out who she was. And I just thought, I am not good enough at keeping secrets. There's no way that I could marry and have children with someone and grow old with them and never be like, you know what? You remember that story about the guy and he was pretending that his mistress was his son and they were on a boat and um, yeah, that was me. I was I was the one dressed in boys clothing. I just, I don't know how she did it. She really kept a lid on it and you gotta wonder about how traumatized she was from the whole situation. Um, she did write a sort of memoir about it. I don't know if it's accessible you know, now to the public, but the author of this book had access to it. Um, and it says a few years before her own death, she received a visitor who had discovered her secret. Um, this was a novelist who hoped to write a novel about Dr. Crippen in the North London cellar murder. She agreed to meet with her, but declined to talk about her past. Um, so I'm not sure how much you could get for the story if she wouldn't talk about it. But anyway... Very, very interesting, fascinating stuff. Didn't want it to end. I kind of took my time with it until, like, the last 
80 pages or so where you're really into the chase part across the Atlantic and it was just like ah. um, so yeah I recommend I've heard in reviews that people think it's not quite as good as Devil in the White City but I'm very very intrigued to read his other books there's a little a little graphic there where you can see some other ones so yeah if you've read Devil in the White City is it worth it no spoilers don't tell me what happens um, I love history so much. I love nonfiction that is written in such a narrative way that really makes you realize that that real life is just way more wild than fiction, stranger than fiction, however you want to look at it. Um, and it, yeah, it's just as good as any made-up story. <laughs> like you couldn't you couldn't make this stuff up, but yeah, you couldn't because it's real. Love it. Okay. Um, I will see you all next time. Don't forget to um, commemorate Titanic in some way this week. I have my Titanic mug that I got at the museum in Southampton. And I gotta, you know, I gotta watch the movie. There is a convention sort of thing going on at the Titanic Orlando exhibit um, for a few days. And I'm very interested in checking that out. I'm not sure which day or like I don't know they're, they're having like historians talk um, and the guy who's creating Titanic Honor and Glory which is the open world um, game that is just like piece by piece they're recreating the Titanic perfectly in this game it's so cool and I would love to hear him speak so we shall see also just totally unrelated they're releasing um, the Lord of the Rings the return of the king on the 13th because this year is the 20th anniversary so if you want to see that in theaters um, I'm gonna try to get there myself have a great week and um, I will see you all next time until then happy reading <laughs>